Um, I want to talk about Paul tonight. You know, there is a plethora of sermons that can come out of Paul's life, for sure. And Paul, after he became a Christian, a follower of Christ, he had a burning desire in his heart to share the, to share the gospel. That's a little sound effect there. Okay. So we're going to try again. <laughs> so uh, anyway, Paul had a burning desire because he knew how it felt to be forgiven. He wanted other people to feel this. He knew what it felt like to finally have a relationship that would change the rest of his life. He knew what it felt like to receive compassion because if we look at what he had did in his life, Compassion is not what should have been on the list. He should have been in jail or killed for the crimes that he had committed against the fellow brothers and sisters. At that time, he didn't know that they were fellow brothers and sisters. He actually thought he was doing God's work. But that's because he knew about God, but he didn't have a relationship with God. And when he had this relationship... He said, I'm going to do that for the rest of my life. As hard as I lived on one side, as hard I'm going to live for God on the other side. And we pick up Paul's story when he is living in Ephesus. And if you don't know much about Ephesus, Ephesus was a very big city by the sea. It had a lot of Gentiles. They weren't people that were raised with the Jewish tradition or the Jewish religion or the Jewish customs. They were very much partiers. They liked to uh, partake of any kind of immorality that you could find because of the different gods that they served. It was all fine as long as you gave a sacrifice or an offering to your God. And when Paul came on the scene, God led him to Ephesus. It led him to a place that was known throughout the world as a dark city. And Paul didn't just come by and do a drive-by. Here's a gospel track here. I like for you to meet Jesus. He actually lived with these people for three years. And as he began to preach and more and more of them became followers of Christ, he knew that he was going to have to relate to them on a place that they could understand. If the Bible was to be written now, I'm sure that it would include things like iPhone and iPod and followers and Facebook and cryptocurrency. But if it was written today, those that would come along thousands of years after us, they would be like, what is that that they're talking about? So because of the distance in time, we sometimes have a little bit of problems relating to what they're talking about. But in those days, it was used a lot of, about agriculture. Jesus would talk a lot about you know, the, the sower and the reaper and talk about different kinds of harvest. And they understood that. And Paul, being a wise fisherman, he thought, how am I going to relate to these people? What is it that's part of their world that I can relate to them on so that I can under give them the understanding of Jesus? He kept trying to tell them that after the Holy Spirit comes into your life, it's going to change you. People will notice a difference about you. And the Holy Spirit is a promise that God has given all of us when we put our faith in God. So he's saying that as Christians, there should be evidence of this. So it's really strange what Paul uses to compare the Holy Spirit to. He compares him to alcohol, wine. That's an odd comparison. But see, they understood that one. If, they, if he was talking about being drunk, they get that one. If he was talking about, you know, having that blackout drunk when you don't remember the next day, oh, they understood that one too. If they were talking about having to break up two guys fighting because they got drunk, they got that. They understood that one. So Paul came to their culture, and he related it to something that they understood. He was teaching them from the ground up. See, he was establishing churches and people that had no idea what it meant to be a Christian. And so if you are ever confused about 
what you should do being a Christian, Ephesians is a really good book for you to read. So Paul, I want to read one scripture, and I'm going to read out of the Amplified Version. And the reason that I am is because when we read out of King James, sometimes since we don't understand the words, it doesn't really hit home as much. If we kind of like skim over it, just kind of like a long time ago, a lady that was a politician talked about this big story about how she went to this place where they were having a war. And when she got out of the airplanes, they had to dodge the bullets and run to the vehicle. Well, that sounded like a really cool story until the video showed up. And the video showed up of they were greeting her and kids were out shaking her hand and giving her hugs as they escorted her safely and quietly to the vehicle and off she took. So rather than saying, I lied, she says, I misspoke. Doesn't that sound nicer? She's like, oh, they just misspoke. It's not, it's not that big of a deal. She just misspoke. But if somebody would have said, well, she flat out lied, you would take that a little bit more seriously. So sometimes when we're reading the Bible, the words that they use, it kind of either we don't understand it or it kind of just like, oh, it's not that big of a deal. But if you read the Amplified Version, it's going to hit home. So let's see how this Bible verse reads according to the Amplified Version. Paul is talking to them, and he says, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is wickedness, corruption, and stupidity. But be filled with the Holy Spirit and constantly guided by him. What he says is don't be filled with wine because that can run your life, but be filled with the Holy Spirit because that can fix your life. He had to give it to something that they could relate to that it would hit home with. Because he knew that no one could consume alcohol until they were drunk and stay the same way. Your actions tell on you. You act a little bit differently. That person that's usually oh so quiet in the office never says a word. You get them drunk and you're like oh my gosh she was dancing on the table. She was hollering at everybody. Her actions was different. Why? Because she was filled with alcohol. Also, too, when they're filled with alcohol, they don't stay the same. Even if they want to act a certain way, sometimes they act opposite of what they know that they should. It changes the way that they walk, and I'm literally, you can change the way that they walk if you've seen them try to walk the line or heaven forbid, walk to the car, but it also changes the walk by what I'm saying, the path that they take in life. It changes the way that they talk. Sometimes they don't talk so clear. They slur their words. Sometimes they won't hush. They say a whole lot of needless words. Sometimes they tell secrets on their self that they wish the next day that they had not said. It changes the way that they think about things, the way that they see things, and the way that they act. Likewise, on the opposite side, no one can be truly filled to the top with the Holy Spirit and stay the same. It changes you from the inside out. He changes the way that you walk, meaning the paths that you take in life. It changes the way that you talk. Because now the Holy Spirit can talk through you, and you can deliver messages of what God wants you to say. It can clean up your language a little bit. Your vocabulary starts to change. It changes the way that you think about things the more that you get filled with His Holy Spirit, and it changes the way that you act. Some people not only get drunk, but they get what they call a blackout drunk, to where the night is a blur to them. They wake up the next morning not really sure what took place. And whether it's been you, you don't have to raise your hand, or someone you know, 
the alcohol has an effect on your physical body. So he says, when you have the Holy Spirit and you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you can't hide that either. There's going to be an evidence with it, and it's clear. See, even if you hide the outward appearance after you've been drinking, especially for those that don't drink, you can smell them a ways off. They may have not drank for a day or two, but because they had consumed so much, here's a heads up for you in case you don't know, this gum doesn't hide it. Brushing your teeth doesn't hide it. Candy doesn't hide it. Because it's a smell that is stronger than whatever you try to put on to hide it. So it, it goes with you. There's a, there's an, even if the outward appearance looks fine, there's still the alcohol symptoms. The Holy Spirit will change the way that we walk. When we walk with God, it says that we are sober-minded. In other words, sober-minded, we can make decisions clearly when we're filled with the Holy Spirit. When we're filled with alcohol, the enemy wants to use that to drive and control your life. But when you have a sober mind, you can navigate your life and he will lead you. When you become a Christian and you get filled with the Holy Spirit, the way that you walk changes. And what I mean by that is the places that you go. You don't walk with the same crowd that you used to walk with before because there's something inside of you that says there's something better for you. You don't need to live that way any longer. In fact, it kind of takes away the desire of who you used to be when you let the Holy Spirit fill your life. You no longer want to go where it would grieve the Holy Spirit. It changes the way that you talk because now he's going to start to speak through you. You become nicer if you're filled with the Holy Spirit. You become more of an encourager if you're filled with the Holy Spirit. You become more like Jesus and less like you. The Bible says to die to yourself, and what that means is to die to the human desires that you used to have before you became a Christian. He's, I want to die to myself so that I can be used by God to reach others for his glory and the ones that he needs me to reach. See, there's no one like you. Out of all the people that have come before you, all the people that will come after you, there's no one like you. And God needs you and your purpose to reach only those that only you can reach. He uses your personality. He uses your talents. He uses your background. He uses your family life and all of your experiences to reach different people. You can reach people that I can't reach because of your experiences. If someone is having a rough time in an area that's a weakness for them and I've never experienced it, I can't really walk with them hand in hand and guide them through it. I can stand on the outside and say I can pray, but see, I'm not going to be the best one to talk to. The best one to talk to is going to be the Christian that has experienced that. The thing, say, I know, I know what you're coming from. In fact, I can finish your sentences, and I'm here to tell you what Jesus can do for you. God needs you and your background. Don't change your personality from who God made you to be. Always become a better version of yourself, but always be yourself, because that's who God designed you to be, to reach the people that only you can reach. But see, he tells us to do this, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You don't just need to be a bunch of sipping saints, just a little here and a little there, because that's not going to get you very far in life. He says, I want you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I want the Holy Spirit to consume you. 
The ones that are what I call the sip and saints are the ones that let the Holy Spirit into just a portion of their life. God, I'm, I'm all yours. I'm all yours on Sunday from 10 to 11. And if I'm feeling really, really spiritual, man, I'm also yours from 6.30 to 7.30. You've got it every single week. I am here and I am yours. Well, you'll have the Holy Spirit, but just a portion working in your life. Because, see, you only allowed it him that much time. If you say, God, I'm going to listen to your word every Sunday. You got me every Sunday I'm listening to your word. You have a little of the Holy Spirit working in your life. But that's not what Paul's saying. He says, I need you to be filled with the Holy Spirit because he knows how strong the enemy is. So I want to give you a, a visual maybe that can help with that. It's like if you have just a little bit of money in your pocket and your car is on E. And you go to the gas station and you say, I've got $3.50. And you put that $3.50 in and it doesn't take very long at all. Well, you have some gas in your vehicle but it's not going to carry you very far before you're going to need to gas up again. However, if it's on E and you fill it up, and you're like, I can go now because my tank, my tank is full. I don't have to really worry about where the next gas station is, and I don't have to say, oh, I can only go this far because that's all I got to carry me through. You say, no, I've got a full tank of gas. And I can go wherever I need to go in town with no worrying because I've filled up. That's the same way spiritually. That's why we get burned out. That's why we get tired. That's why we get frustrated. That's why we grow distant. How much room have you let the Holy Spirit have inside of your life? That's what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. See, it changes not only the way that we walk, but it changes the way that we talk. We respond differently because the Holy Spirit will say when somebody is dogging on you and you know the right thing to say, you know something that would shut them up that quick, and they may be even telling you a lie, and you're like, I know that's a lie right there, but the Holy Spirit is saying, don't say anything. And you're like, but God, I got the perfect thing to say, and I need to teach them a lesson. He's like, don't say anything. You might even say, well, are you telling them that? They're a Christian too. But God say, don't worry about them. I'm talking to you. That's the Holy Spirit inside of you. That's what it talks about when you die to yourself. Because see, yourself is going to want to tell them off. But the Holy Spirit is going to say, wait, just wait. I'm working some stuff out. And if you're filled with the Holy Spirit and you listen to the Holy Spirit, you're not going to walk away having to take back some words that you really shouldn't have said. You'll be known as the one that's going to let God use his words through your mouth at the right time. And if you're really, really lucky, there might be a time that you might get to say all that stuff. But it has to do with the attitude that it comes from. It also may be the enemy testing you to see if he can get you to lose your cool just as somebody comes by that just saw you at church on Sunday and you didn't even know they were there. There's a reason that God tells you to keep your mouth closed at certain times. Also, the enemy, I've had times where there's certain things that I wanted to say and I was justified in saying those right things, I thought. And God said, keep your mouth closed. And I did. But also, too, I think part of it was the enemy coming at me because it was really upsetting my world. And so I said out loud, because the enemy can hear you out loud, I said, all right, but the next time, the next time, I'm saying it. There was no next time. I wish there would have been. Maybe he will let you have a next time. But what that let me know is the enemy also had his hand in that. That wasn't just a God test. That was the enemy because that next time, all of a sudden, they just, their mouths shut up. And they were just nice. And to be real honest, 
my human side really wanted to tell them off. I wanted them to be just a little bit rude. And all of a sudden, it was like night and day. Now they just acted like they were my very best friend. And I'm like, okay. But see, when I listened to the Holy Spirit, I didn't have to go back and apologize. So later, I thanked God for keeping my mouth shut. <laughs> God says, I don't want you to misrepresent me just so that you can satisfy your flesh. See, the Holy Spirit not only changes the way that we walk and the way that we talk, but he also changes the way that we act. Drunkenness will do the same thing. You might have somebody, one of your friends, that's four foot ten, and all of a sudden they get six shots in them, and they think they can take on everybody in the bar at once, and they're just looking for a fight. It doesn't matter the height. And you have to go around and say, excuse me, they don't know what they're talking about. They're drunk. They've lost their mind. Please don't kill my friend. But they're like, no, no, I can, I can take them. Because it changes the way that they act and the way that they look at things. The Holy Spirit will change the way that you act. No longer will you be afraid of the enemy and worrying about what's going to happen next. And am I going to be Okay. All of a sudden, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're going to know that because of who you have dwelling with inside of you, that you're going to be okay no matter what happens. So Paul's telling the people, don't be filled with the wine. Don't be filled with the alcohol. I got something much better for you. Because so often when you get filled with the wine or the alcohol, it's not always just to have a good time. Sometimes it's trying to escape what you don't want to look at any longer. Sometimes it's trying to help you go to sleep because you can't turn your mind off. There's many reasons that people turn to alcohol and Paul saying, but I've got the fix for you. I've got the thing that can calm your mind so that you can sleep. I've got the thing that can heal the pain of the past and the worry about tomorrow. And it's a gift just for the asking, and it's called the Holy Spirit. See, Jesus, he doesn't give up on people. He stays, and he sits right there beside you waiting for you to finally accept his gift. With his Holy Spirit on the inside of you, you'll be an effective witness for him. When you only fill up your tank part of the way with the Holy Spirit, that's what they talk about when you quench the Spirit. You stifle him and you limit what he can do in your life. And you run out of supernatural help because you've kept the container small and limited and you haven't poured, let him pour in to you. But when your tank's full, when your heart's full of the Holy Spirit, you can go with confidence. Some of us can't be used by God to the extent that he wants to use us because we're running on a half a tank of gas or less. Supernatural-wise is what I'm talking about. God says, I can't open the door to this place for you or give you this blessing because you're not able to handle it, because you're not filled up with me. What would church be like if we filled up all week long with God and the Holy Spirit? What would church be like if when you walk through those doors, rather than coming with your burdens and upset and can't wait to get to church so you can be lifted up and encouraged, what would happen if you came full with a full tank, already filled with the Holy Spirit? You'd set this world on fire. It would be a game changer. I'm not saying that church is not a place to come and get filled up when you need to get filled up. But I'm just saying, if we get used to letting the Holy Spirit fill up our life Monday through Saturday. I think Sundays would be a little bit different. I think prayers would be a little bit more powerful. I think when we go leave this place here, I think Mondays would be a little bit different in the world if we spent time in the week filling our supernatural tank with the word of God, listening to a praise and worship song, spending time in prayer with him, 
looking for ways to be a blessing to other people and a blessing to God. Because when you take care of God's needs, he does have needs, because you're now his hands, his feet, his words extended. When you take care of him, oh, he's so good to take care of you. He will make sure that you have what you need in life when you take care of him. The world would change and we would see healings and miracles everywhere. and We wouldn't have to pray for revivals to happen. They would already be in our soul. See, that's what a revival is. We think it's for these great services and that is part of it. But a revival is actually a revival in your soul. That's something that you can revive your mind and you can revive your soul and you can have that revival every single morning when you wake up. Why? Because even if you were a jerk the night before, even if you messed up the night before, the minute you open your eyes, if God has given you the gift of living another day, it says, my mercies are brand new. You've got a clean slate again. Oh, there's so much to be happy for in this life. There's so much that can be changed in this life, and God needs you. You may think, well, nobody needs me. The creator of the universe needs you. He needs your personality. He needs your talents. He needs your time. He needs your mental capacities. He needs you. Don't let the enemy tell you that you're not valued, that you're not worthy. You should walk out of here like a 10-foot tall giant saying, I have the Holy Spirit on the inside of me because it was a gift. And because of that, I can do all things. And I have the God of the universe that when he could have created anybody, it says that the combination he could have created 100,000 different people when he chose you. Wow, you're big stuff. You were born for a reason. And the enemy wants to tear you down and tell you that you can't really make a big difference. But you have the Holy Spirit dwelling within you. And as powerful, it can only be as powerful, though, as you will let it be. How much room will you give it in your life? I'm asking God that he will change us from the inside out. He will change not only the way that we talk, but the way that we act and the way that we walk, not for our credit, but for his glory. That's my prayer. And that's my prayer for our church and everyone that is a follower of Christ, that you finally say, Holy Spirit, fill me. Fill me from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. Fill me so that I can see things that only you would be able to show me. To give me revelations that only I would know only through your power. Holy Spirit, fill me so that I can see lives changed. So that I can see the enemies taken off of people that have a broken heart and are lost and confused the Holy Spirit can do that through each and every one of us if we'll change the way that we walk and walk more like him. If we'll change the way that we talk and talk more like him. And most importantly, if we'll change the way that we act and act most like him. The closing song tonight is Holy Spirit Rain Down. And I don't know about you, but if you don't have an umbrella and there's a cloud burst, it's obvious when you come to see somebody that's inside that you've been rained on. They can tell you don't even have to say, whoo, it's really raining outside. They'll say, whoo, it's raining outside, isn't it? As you slosh around wet. See, I want the Holy Spirit to be so strong in my life that they'll say, whoo, there's something different. You don't even have to say anything. I, I can tell by looking at you that there's something different inside of you. That's what I want for each of us. So tonight, if you haven't let the Holy Spirit have full reign and you're up for this wonderful adventure that makes life really worth living, maybe ask God to let the Holy Spirit rain down on you tonight. Not just 
a sprinkle, not just a drizzle, but a downpour like they have here in Missouri to just drench you from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet and then see what life will be like. I promise it's a great ride. God bless you.